the vision is revolutionary. Imagine a radical new approach to medical science that utilizes our newfound abilities to manipulate the world of the infinitesimally small, the nano dimension. Imagine tiny sentinels that monitor the minute-by-minute -minute status of our health. Imagine a science that promises radical developments in cell regeneration, our ability to repair lost or damaged tissues. A science that could extend life, revolutionize medical practice. As you can see from the many tools that are out there now, uh, and the systems that are going now into hospitals. So this is not a pipe dream, it's reality. A scenario that also approaches science fiction, a vision that, according to some, promotes the emergence of a new human being with enhanced skills and intelligence. But will that promise be fulfilled? And if so, what repercussions will these advances have on our lives? What new questions will we confront? What new issues will we face? We have always counted on new technologies to help us shape our world. Now, researchers are crossing another technological frontier. In the nano-dimension, they're learning to manipulate the most intimate mechanics of life. And they promise us more control of our bodies and of our environment. This three-part series explores a mysterious and unknown universe and the revolution it promises. Nanotechnology is already improving our ability to detect the first signs of disease and diagnose genetic predispositions earlier and more efficiently. Conventional tests are time-consuming and expensive. Doctors must depend on complex protocols and sophisticated tools. Many tests must be sent on to large centralized laboratories. To be really fast and efficient, diagnosis would be done on site. Labs and patients would be in the same place at the same time. Dr. Chad Merkin, director of the International Institute for Nanotechnology at Northwestern University. Uh, nanotechnology, nanotechnology brings a revolution to medicine in many different, different areas. Uh, so, so in the diagnostic front, it's, it's going to create very accurate, very, very sensitive tools that enable point-of-care point diagnostics. The point, point of care being hospitals, the emergency room, and, and one day, I think, eventually the doctor's office and home. People have talked about this now for a couple of decades. In this case, the nanotech advances are really making it happen. Why such confidence? Because it is precisely at the nanometric scale that the first signs of a disease appear. A human body contains about 100 trillion living cells. In order to coexist together, the cells exchange messages the messages are tiny molecules, DNA fragments or complex proteins that are only a few nanometers in size. The cascades of reactions set off by these molecular messengers are the language of life, the most intimate form of communication. When a cell is sick, it sends out different messages. Biologists call them biomarkers. They are the molecular signatures of disease and the clues, the indicators, on which the most sophisticated diagnostic instruments depend. It turns out that there is a unique genetic marker and oftentimes a unique protein marker for almost every disease out there, anything living, in fact. And so over the last couple of decades, the world has gotten very good at identifying what these markers are and, and now, now we can, can begin to create tests for all sorts of different markers that allow us to rapidly assess, determine the state of the disease, and then a course of therapy that follows. This revolution is already underway. The first diagnostic systems based on Chad Merkin's research have already been installed in some American hospitals. 
The machine embodies many of the advances that nanoscientists promote. It's simple, fully automated, and uses disposable cartridges. A single sample allows doctors to detect the presence of different diseases, genetic predispositions, or viruses in the blood. The biggest, biggest benefit, benefit for doctors is being able to detect multiple, multiple different organisms or multiple different targets in the same reaction and to get a decreased turnaround time. The system was to prove its worth in a recent and potentially threatening flu scare. In 2009, we saw um, a recent outbreak of a novel strain of influenza, 2009 H1N1, and through use of nanotechnology, we were able to detect the pathogen, identify it, and determine what type of organism it was, and we were able to do that in a period of about three and a half hours, as opposed to traditional culture methods, which would require that we would grow the organism, and that would then be followed by detecting the organism, and that could take in total of 14 days. For William Moffat, head of Nanosphere, the company which engineered the system, simplicity is a key asset. So, so the, the big difference that the uh, nanotechnology uh, enables is us to be able to make this in a unit use disposable format so that all the components and elements necessary to do this test are engineered into the, to the product itself. So, so an extraordinarily accurate, extraordinarily precise technology that's very simple and low cost to use. But how does this small device replace the work of a whole laboratory? In order to look for biomarkers of diseases, researchers can rely on a fundamental property of molecular messengers. They bind exclusively to certain other molecules according to a lock and key logic. These bonding molecules, called ligands, are receptors which can be used to identify and capture the target should the disease be present. To detect the disease, the researchers need to see whether binding has occurred at a molecular level. To find a solution, Chad Merkin looked back to the days of medieval artisans and their use of gold. Gold, gold nanoparticles, nanoparticles are little clusters of gold, actually, actually red in color when they're under 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, they're, they're very intensely colored, so very dilute solutions appear as highly colored solutions. And actually, for that reason, they were used as uh, stains and stained glass windows back in the Middle Ages. Now, the eternal glitter of gold has a new and more high-tech application. Scientists can stick biological ligands to gold nanoparticles, creating new particles that stand out clearly and are easily detectable. You can think of them as little nano beacons, uh, structures that can latch on to a target molecule that tells me a particular disease marker is present, and then gives me a burst of signal. They can differentiate one disease target in the presence of a sea of millions of other disease targets with incredible specificity, in fact, 100% accuracy in most tests. Nano-researchers believe that the appeal of personalized medicine will outweigh the high costs. So it is going to change medicine. It's going to allow clinicians the ability to detect more things, and we're going to be able to develop diagnostics that are fit for individual patients as opposed to those that are developed for the masses. The full impact of this revolution is yet to come. Currently, the system can only perform about 10 different tests. But as new ligands are added, the range of targeted biomarkers can be increased. And these types of tools, as the menu grows and the different capabilities uh, are added to the same uh, basic system, uh, the, the wealth of information one can collect is, is just mind-boggling. You're going to see this ability to detect really low quantities of targets to completely transform the field of medicine because you're effectively taking the blinders off. You're increasing the capabilities of the radar. Other diagnostic devices are coming onto the market, some of them from nano innovations in strikingly different fields. In Italy, Dr. Silvano Dragonieri is trying an unusual approach to disease diagnosis. He's adapting the use of a device originally developed for military purposes to detect traces of explosives or toxic spills. 
as well as to carry out checks in the food industry. A portable electronic nose. We just, just took it, it and, uh, because it's easily available uh, and uh, not, not too expensive, expensive in order to check whether it could be applied for medicine. Dragonieri's artificial nose has 32 electronic sensors. But in this case, the sensors detect disease, not explosives. As with the dog's recognition of scent, the electronic nose doesn't so much analyze the scent as recognize its pattern and imprint. Paralleling some kinds of pattern recognition software, it detects the big picture rather than separate components. Silvano Dragonieri thinks the nose could detect the first signs of a range of diseases in the breath of a patient. It's been uh, found out in the last years that uh, uh, human exhaled breath contains more than 3,000 uh, volatile organic compounds. When you're sick, there's a change in the body's metabolism, a change in chemistry. Subjects, for example, with lung cancer uh, show different uh, volatile organic compounds compared to subjects without it. According to Dragonieri, the nose could be programmed to distinguish between a pathological imprint and a healthy one. Nowadays, the CT scan is the only diagnostic tool used for early detection of lung cancer, but it's expensive and cumbersome. Obtaining a reliable and fast diagnosis simply by blowing into a plastic bag would be both faster and cheaper. The, the nose, nose is able, able to distinguish subject with asthma from subject without it, subject with lung cancer from subject without it, and from subject with chronic bronchitis. Research is being carried out in laboratories around the world, and some scientists suggest that this type of diagnostic device could be in use within the next decade. Should the promise be fulfilled, these advances in early detection will make diagnosis more immediate and less intrusive. I came here for the first time in 2040. I've just met this girl, Lisa and she dreamt about visiting the city of the future, as the media called it. I had plenty of time, and she was good-looking, so why not? Nano city or not, it seemed that some things would never change. Customs, immigration, and public health service. Well, here they were called customs, immigration, and public health. Simple formality. And they were very polite. This way, please. Perhaps too polite. Come on, darling. Thanks. First, uh, would like they led us into separate rooms, but I soon felt this was not going to be the usual interview. Sorry to interrupt your journey, but we're working with the public health. This was a public health investigation, and they had good news we for me. Good news. I didn't carry any Class A virus. They have a control test, which means that you are not a class But they had noticed that neither Lisa nor I were wearing any check patch. Check patch. A check patch. A check patch. As you can see on my colleague's wrist. In fact, Check Patch was a new real-time diagnostic device, and they were offering to lend me one for the rest of my stay here. I would benefit from high-tech medical protection while in the city, and at the same time, wouldn't pose a potential health threat to the locals. We perfectly understand. The very idea of this invasion of my privacy was unacceptable. And their attitude had started to get on my nerves. I began wondering whether this wasn't some marketing stunt initiated by Check Patch. Call my lawyer. Don't put other people's health in I let them know I'd had enough of this. Okay, okay, okay. Save your breath. My answer is no. But apparently their Check Patch was not compulsory. I'd like to go. Very well, sir. As you wish, you're free to go. But first, if you please. Could you, Could you sign, sign this, please? please? Still, they didn't let me go without signing an official disclaimer. Thank, Thank you, sir. 
Goodbye. Goodbye. And enjoy your stay. stay.